Welcome to Millsaps. For those who are visiting, we're glad to see all of you here today. My name is Kenneth Townsend, and I chair the Public Events Committee of the college. Um, and we are really excited about having Judge Reeves here with us today to celebrate Constitution Day. For those of you who saw my email earlier in the week, 231 years ago this week, we signed the Constitution of the United States, and we are celebrating that. So let's give the Constitution a hand real quick. So Judge Reeves is a federal judge here in the Southern District of Mississippi, and for those who follow legal matters, you know that he has come to be, and I'm not exaggerating here, one of the most well-known and well-respected federal judges in the entire nation. I went to law school up in the Northeast and have friends who are practicing law all around the nation, and a few years ago when he delivered his remarks um, when sentencing these young men who had committed a heinous, heinous crime um, and murdered uh, James Craig Anderson back in 2011, those sentencing remarks ended up attracting attention from all over the nation and I think put Judge Reeves on some people's radar who might not have been on before. But he has uh, before then and since then issued a number of opinions in, in high-profile civil rights cases ranging from hate crimes to uh, gay rights to abortion, you name it, and he's probably handled it. Um, today, he is going to reflect with us just a little bit on his experiences as a federal judge here in Mississippi with an eye towards some constitutional matters. And then after that, he's really interested in having this be a conversation as much as possible. And so after some introductory remarks, he's going to open the floor up to all of us to have a conversation with him. So what a treat, right? Um, let's give it up for uh, Judge Reeves, a native of Yazoo City. I should have said that. So he's a native Mississippian. Um, and uh, he has spent most of his professional life, pretty much all of his professional life, here back in his home state of Mississippi. So welcome, Judge Reeves. We're so very very happy to have you with us today. You can be famous or infamous for a number of reasons, so for whatever, whichever it is, take it for whatever you wish. I see I'm being recorded today, so that means I'll have to be on my best behavior and, and uh, make sure we say things all perfectly and, and correctly. It's so good to be here at Millsaps uh, among many friends I see out in the audience and, and stuff. Um, uh, before I start, I, I brought my three law clerks with me. Uh, I was telling Sheila Flaherty that I would make sure I, I mentioned my three law clerks because they're certainly important to the work uh, that we do. Is Andrew Cantor is my one of my permanent law clerks, and he's been with me for quite a few years, and Chelsea Lewis has, uh, came on the board a couple of weeks before Labor Day, and uh, Deidre Jones came about uh, the day after Labor Day. So, and since, that, and since that time, we all have been laboring. We all have been working uh, real hard uh, on various things. Kenneth said the most appropriate thing about me, and people will know that I'm very proud of Yazoo City, uh, and uh, that I am uh, from Yazoo City, and I, I, I tell other people about the experiences there, uh, having grown up in Yazoo City and, and all, and uh, just for your own information, Yazoo City has always, you can go back and look at the 1950, I think, 1960, 70, 80 census, and it's always about the same, probably within a few hundred uh, uh, population. Uh, but believe it or not, uh, at the size of that town, which is about 12,000 or less, I, I should have gone and looked that up right uh, before I came here. Uh, there are three sitting federal judges from the Azure City, Mississippi. Three from that small town. Uh, and we, uh, 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 Judge William uh, H. Barber, who, uh, in whose seat, he held the seat that I currently sit in. When he retired, I was nominated by President Obama to fill that seat. Uh, so that made two of us. And after, uh, in 2013, I believe it was, Judge Deborah Brown in the Northern District 
uh, from Yazoo City uh, was appointed uh, to the court. Uh, in the Northern District of Mississippi, she actually sits in Greenville, and I tell the story of how we grew up across the ditch from one another. Uh, I lived on uh, 9th Street, and she lived on Cypress Circle, and it was just around the corner. Uh, but, but it tells you a lot about uh, uh, a little bit of Mississippi history and, and Yazoo City and, and, and all of that. So uh, uh, I am from Yazoo City. And just a little bit more about me, and this is not about me. This is supposed to be about the Constitution. But just a little bit more about me. Uh, the, the other biographical piece that I think is always important in my life as I reflect on things and how I see the world and how the world has shaped me and, 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 and things. I uh, started the first grade at Annie Ellis Elementary right there on Grand Avenue. Oh, of course, Grand Avenue is one of the central avenues in Mississippi to the extent that there are big avenues in Mississippi. Uh, excuse me, Yazoo City. Annie Ellis Elementary, 1970, September. I, I'm pretty sure we started school back then in September. We used to go one day on that Friday, uh, uh, wear all our new clothes on that Friday, and then be off Monday for Labor Day, and then come back to school on Tuesday. So I'm pretty sure in 1970 that was the case. Now we got kids going to school the first week of August. Uh, but, but it was September back then. There was one critical piece of information about 1970. In December 1969, the Supreme Court came down with the US Supreme Court came down with the Alexander versus Holmes County decision, uh, which uh, uh, prior to that in 1954, of course, we, we remember Brown versus Board of Education. And in the Brown decision, the, the, the Supreme Court said that there should be no more segregation, said there should be no more segregation, but it had a caveat in that. And as we know, for those who are constitutional scholars, for those who know a little about, about a little bit about history, for those who understand that you know our America is always growing, and it's still a very young country when we look at the world's uh, countries, it's very young, so we're still growing, and so part of our growth is uh, you you'll see throughout our history compromises and and things. And there was language in the Brown decision. I, I don't know what the debate around the language was because we never go into the rooms, into the, uh, uh, the, the, the deliberation room or the chamber's room where the nine Supreme, Supreme Court justices sit and decide and debate. But the uh, uh, Brown decision and a decision that followed it, uh, Brown too, had the caveat in it that, that you should desegregate with all deliberate speed. And all deliberate speed turned out to mean, or oh, it gave many states many opportunities to be very, very deliberate. Uh, 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 I went to school at, at uh, college, at, uh, law school at University of Virginia, and I learned by that that all deliberate speed meant to them they would just shut down public education in some communities, period. Would not offer it. Would not offer it in, in some of the counties uh, in Virginia. They just decided that they would not offer public education. Uh, we did not have that here in Mississippi. We had all deliberate speed in many other ways. Uh, 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 school choice plans and, and okay, all deliberate speed will allow integrate, we, we will allow the 12th graders to go first, then the 11th graders, we'll do 11th and then 12th, 12th in, in reverse order, and finally get to the elementary kids. So all deliberate speed meant a lot of things to a lot of communities here in Mississippi. 
1968, there was this case from Holmes County that went up, and it included uh, Singleton Jackson versus uh, the, the Singleton decision here in uh, Jackson and all others. But there the Supreme Court finally said all deliberate speed means now. <laughs> means now. And, and that Supreme Court said now means now. So when the kids were at home over Christmas break in their marginally uh, desegregated schools, uh, when they came back from the Christmas holiday, they realized that all delivery speed meant now. So when the kids came back to school in the spring of 1970, they were integrated. And if you, uh, one of the uh, books that I have on my shelf is Yazoo, uh, a, 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 The Integration of a Southern School or a Southern Town by Willie Morris. Uh, uh, tells the story of Yazoo City uh, adapting to that decision and the, and the uh, uh, efforts to integrate uh, or desegregate or integrate or whatever you want to call that was going on during that 1970 period. Uh, so in 19, uh, again, in the spring of 1970, uh, the school, the students had gone on Christmas, then they came back, and they had completely new people sitting next to them. I tell that part of the story because in September, as I told you, I, I'm pretty sure I had a pair of new jeans or, or a new something. We started the first grade there in Kansas City. I had gone to uh, St. Francis for kindergarten. Uh, Judge Deborah Brown and I actually uh, had been at St. Francis together. But we started, uh, 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 but that first year, 19, in September 1970, it was time for us to go to Annie Ellis, time for me to go to Annie Ellis. And I went to Annie Ellis. And, and the, the piece that I tell people about me is that that was the first class in Yazoo City, Mississippi in 1970, 16 years after Brown, that started out in an integrated setting. And so that class that ended up graduating in 1982 was the first class group of kids that had gone to school together from first through 12th grade in an integrated, desegregated environment. The first one. So that sort of shapes, to some degree, who I am, how I see the world, what I know. Because uh, I've always, and I tell people, I've always been around white people. Always, since the first grade. I've always known that I was making the same grades, good or bad, as the other people in the room, the white kids in the room, the black kids in the room. Now, Yezu City did his own things. I mean, uh, you know, the, you know, you know, you know, the yeah, the, a, the A class, the B class, the C class, and as you got. As your grade, as your quote unquote class got closer to the D's and the, or the C's or whatever, uh, there was a much darker U in those classes. So there were very few. I was fortunate enough to have been uh, placed in what I, in my mind, was the A's class. So it was very few black people in the class. Uh, but I knew that uh, growing up, the, the kids who I grew up with, I knew that they were struggling with some of the things that I was struggling with. They would make not so passing grades in some of the courses that I was not making not so passing grades. I was, uh, we were making A's in classes together. We uh, talked among each other, we played with each other, and we did all of those things with each other. And so, we, as we got older, we engaged in 
extracurricular activities together. We played sports together. We, we did music together. Uh, 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 mostly as we got older in high school, uh, uh, you know, there were kids, I wanted to be in the band. I couldn't afford to be in the band. I wanted to play the saxophone. That was the one thing I wanted to do. But uh, I had to pass up on that because I couldn't afford it. Uh, but, but, but for those who were in the band together, they were in the band together. For those who were in the choir together, they were in the choir together. For, we did things together there at Yazoo City Public Schools. We did it together. Now, again, the life of growing up in Yazoo City, however, was that most of the most of that activity where we merged our being happened there at the school. It happened there at the school. So what does that mean? So what happens in the summer? What happens over the weekend? What happens uh, in those other in those other times? Well, what happened was we went our separate ways. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes we might have uh, uh, engaged with each other, very rare, I think, over the weekends or anything like that. And over the summer growing up, we had the Babe Ruth, excuse me, oh, whew, that was wrong. We had the Roy Campanella Baseball League. And on Jackson Street and on that side of town, they had the Babe Ruth League. And so we, as growing up playing uh, 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 Little League Baseball and, and Pony League Baseball, growing up, we played at Roy Campanella where we had our swimming pool and we had our baseball fields and we had our own system of we played, we did our thing on that side of town. The side of town that was up Champlin Avenue, 7th Street. That Champlin is now Martin Luther King uh, uh, in Yazoo City. So, so we grew up uh, uh, while playing ball in the summers with each other. So we would come back in the fall and the school sports and stuff would be competitive and football and baseball and uh, uh, basketball to the extent that you had uh, 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 any, uh, any guys who uh, 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 from the other side of the tracks who played basketball. Typically, uh, you, uh, it was just primarily African American young guys. But you had basketball, you had baseball, you had all that. But for 12 years, that's how it existed. And Miss Dorothy Rankin, who had grown up in Yazoo City, who had gone off to uh, live in California and came back, I think she must have come, come back to Yazoo City when I was about in the ninth grade, I think, or tenth grade. Miss Rankin brought back this crazy notion, this idea that we ought to, uh, this, this, this ridiculous, this, this new notion. Uh, we ought to have um, a prom together. A prom together. And she started putting that bug in people's ear. And by the time of 1982, the class that I was in had the first integrated prom. It was not attended by everybody. But it was integrated nonetheless. And it was the first one in Yazoo City to be sponsored by the school. We had it at the school. Uh, we had it at the school, sponsored by the school, and we had it there in 1982. But that was a novel notion that these kids who had known each other for the last 12 years, who had gone from six years old, gone through that rough transition of 
junior high and puberty and hormone changes and all that. And then by the time that they're 18, they can participate in an integrated prom. And, uh, uh, and our class theme for that year, uh, uh, our class song for that year was Ebony and Ivory. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was Ebony and Ivory. Uh, and so that just sort of, when, when Kenneth mentioned I was from Yazoo City, that's the part of being from Yazoo City that I like to tell people that, that, that uh, I saw my hometown struggle through issues. The kids were not inoculated from that, but kids are very adaptable to things. And we saw things from the kids' perspectives through the eyes of children. So we were friends with one another. We visited to some degree at a time or two. We visited each other's home. I remember distinctly being in the sixth grade working on the science project where we met, um, uh, believe it or not, no matter what uh, Henry Barber is one of my good friends. Henry Barber, Haley Barber's nephew. Henry Barber, who is RNC, whatever, way up in the food chain of the RNC. He's my good friend. But I remember going to his house, a group of us, Thomas Harvey, Charles DeSalle, James Dean, Don Brown, myself, at, at his house working on a science project. Kids are very adaptable to what they do. What does that have to do with the Constitution? I don't know. There's no amendment that says that kids are, are good, but, but there's a, just a couple. But, but, but when Kenneth mentioned Yazoo City and mentioned who I am, you know, to get in the minds of the guy who wrote or the guy who's, who spoke to the young guys who murdered James Anderson, to get into the mind of where you might think I might be coming from. And, and, in, and when you think about that piece of decision, the thing hardest for me is to grapple with was how did that happen? in 2013 or 14 or 12 or whenever it happened. I think I did the, uh, I think I sentenced a young man in 2014, I think. Uh, could have been a little bit earlier than that. But how did that happen? And how as a, how as a community do we allow that to happen? How as parents, what are our kids observing from us? Because kids learn things. I, I don't necessarily believe in the notion that a kid comes out of a womb corrupted and forever corruptible. I don't believe that. I think, yeah, you, you, you learn behavior, you learn things. So, so when I did that and, and sort of, as you, as if you go back and read it or go back and talk about it or think about it, you will see who that was writing that piece and thinking about what I want my Mississippi to be. And I want my Mississippi to be a better place than what it was before I stepped, before I took a step on Mississippi soil. So I tell all folk, and, and, and I'm gonna wrap up soon because uh, we, we are going to uh, hopefully engage in some conversation, and I'll talk about the things uh, uh, that I can talk about. Uh, but, but I remind uh, people when I talk to them, you know, we have an obligation as citizens to do what we can do to make this place better for every other citizen. We have that unique obligation. We have the Constitution, Mr. Townsend, gives us that opportunity. Here we get a chance to be heard. We participate in our elections. We vote. We back candidates. We back causes. We vote. 
we participate in our democracy through voting. And that vote has powerful consequences. As you know, it determines when the school system might decide, for example, to be less deliberate about not complying with the U.S. Supreme Court order. Read local people. There's a, there's a, uh, and, and, and it's a well-known story, but read local people by John Dittman, who used to be a professor too, I think. He tells the story of, of the uh, citizens in my Yazoo City in 1955, I believe it was, 54, 55. How dare black folk go before the city council and say, look, y'all, there has been a ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. Will you all please implement Brown versus the Board of Education and allow the kids to go to school with one another? They signed a petition with the NAACP, at the, you, know, at the, you know, with the urging and the assistance of the NAACP. They signed a petition. They signed a petition. They said, please do. Those who were in power, however, took that petition and they made sure that the rest of the community knew who these black folk were. How dare they ask us to comply with a, a, a decision from the U.S. Supreme Court that is just abominable and wrong in our minds. How dare they? So what did they do? They printed each of those black folks' names in the local newspaper. They took, the, they, they took the, that newspaper and they posted it all throughout downtown. Even in the cotton fields, ladies and gentlemen, so that these black folks could be identified so that you would know, so that we would know we are not to do business with these folk. Because how dare they? This is my answer to say. How dare they? How dare, how dare they ask for that? James Wright, a master plumber. Well, as a plumber, you have to get your supplies from somewhere. He wasn't able to get his supplies. Not a master anymore. People like Lottie Tubbs, who worked in the homes of folk, lost their jobs. Job as raising the other folk, children, cleaning the other folk homes. They lost those because they dared to make sure that the fulfillment of 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 Brown, the fulfillment of the Constitution, because Brown says our Constitution does not allow the races to live separately. But how dare they ask for that? But that was my years of city. So I think about those things when I think about that vote. I think about Vernon Damon saying, you know, if you don't vote, you don't count. And I think about all those opportunities we have, the precious opportunities to make a difference just by that mere vote. And that is extended to each of us. And we do have an obligation to embrace candidates, embrace causes, embrace ideas, and to participate in our democracy in that way. Equally, we have another way that we participate in our democracy. Again, it's recognized by the Constitution. It's recognized in the, in the, the Seventh Amendment, I do believe. It's the, the, it's the opportunity to serve on a jury. We have to, when we get that summons, you have to show up. You have to participate. You cannot have these idle excuses that I have to go to work. 
I can't do it because I don't feel like it. I'm skittish about ooh, passing judgment on people. You have to participate in that jury. You have to serve. Because that's what we do. We ask people not to settle their differences in the back alleys. We ask them to come to the court of law. And we have to, have to make sure that that system itself is preserved and that system itself is, 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 is respected and that system itself has all of our participation. It is so very important for us to participate in jury service. Everybody does not think alike. Everybody does not hear things the same way. I'll give you one example, because you all understand. Some of you will understand. Some of you probably won't. Some of you are too young. Others of you may be too old. <laughs> 1982. This is after Carlton Reeves has graduated from Kansas City High. So I go to Jackson State. Uh, and, and there's a whole story behind that that we won't talk about. We don't have time to tell. Uh, but I go to Jackson State, which began to, you know, it's, it's, I've made many great decisions in my life, but, but the opportunity I've gone to Jackson State was, was certainly one of the foremost best decisions that I've made. But I went to Jackson State, and my roommate was a math pre-engineer major. I'm going to school, I'm political science, and I, I knew at the time that I wanted to be a lawyer and all that kind of stuff, and I'm trying to get to know this new guy. I'm trying to figure him out. He's trying to figure me out, his name is uh, Tyrone Dodson, who, who's from Atlanta, and he's smart as all get out in math. I mean, you know, we were in the honors program together. Uh, uh, I signed up for algebra, algebra two, I think it was, and uh, he said, you know, he he math pre engineer major. He wanted to start out, I mean, we were all supposed to just take, you know, general math or, or algebra. He, he like started out at calculus two. I'm like, man, I, I couldn't even remember if we even offered calculus in Yazoo City at that time. But he wanted to start out in, uh, in Cal too. So he, he told the, our honors advisor, no, I'm starting out with Cal, and that's what he did. But as we got to know each other, we're talking to each other, we're trying to figure out, and uh, uh, we, you know, you're trying, I mean, you're just trying to figure people out. So, you, what music do you like? What, do, you know? And uh, uh, Tyrone mentions, uh, uh, we were talking about music, and he said one of the greatest uh, pieces of music out there is uh, 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 Stay Away to Heaven. I agree. That's the OJ's, right? I know. Come on. Come on, black over here. That's the OJ's. Here we go. Climbing the stairway to heaven. Right? And I said, yeah, man, you're right. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, no, I'm talking about Led Zeppelin. And this was a brother from Atlanta. I didn't know what the hell Led Zeppelin was. You're going to put a pause on that when I say that. <laughs> I, mean, so, I mean, so you take those sort of experiences of who you are when you get into that jury room. You take those kinds of things, and you hear things differently. And because of how you grew up, you know, some of us, you know, in general, some of us just don't believe everything law enforcement has said just because it has come from law enforcement. Because we've seen things differently from others. Some of us are, have learned to look at law enforcement with a little doubt and a little timidity and a little fear, while others, others have been taught. 
If you're in trouble, the first thing you do is go tell the police officer because that person is going to help you. But you need those different dynamics in a jury room. So when you get that jury summons, go. Make sure that the government, make sure that the parties, make sure, make sure that you test our system. You have to put the brakes on our system. You have to test the system. You have to make sure. There's a whole big debate now about whether or not, you know, we, we just don't have enough jury trials, whether we have too many guilty pleas. Nobody goes to trial anymore. And if you don't go to trial, if you don't test the system, people tend to get lazy. Prosecutors get lazy. Police officers get sloppy. Parties get uh, lackadaisical about what they need to prove. You see these massive arrests of people. You see, you hear these heinous crimes, and then you'll see some other blog where they say, the judge let somebody go free. The judge didn't do his or her job. The judge is not, uh, uh, that person only got two years got 15 years, and they suspended 13. He's been in jail a year and a half, so now he's out free. But sometimes the judge is only following the recommendation of the prosecutor. If you're in that courtroom to see some of the things that you read about, you might be a little disheartened. That's our other way that we're going to do public service. I've told you voting. I've told you jury duty. You need to be court, courthouse monitors. You need to be there in the courtroom just to see. We hear about what goes on or doesn't go on in the city council meeting, what goes on and what doesn't go on in Congress, what goes on in the, in the legislature. We hear about what mayors do, what, what supervisors do, what what governors do, what the president does or does not do. We hear about all those things, but we don't hear much sometimes about the court system. And if you go to your county justice court, you will see justice being served in all the wrong ways. You will see it. You will feel it. You will see just how our system corrodes the lives of people forever. Because sometimes you get these any type of conviction on you, and sometimes that removes you from the process of what? Voting and serving on the jury duty. And serving on the jury. So use this opportunity. All courthouses, for the most part, are open to the public. So, you know. When a judge said, oh, you're not allowed to be in here. No, I want to see my third branch of the government operate. I can be here. I'm interested. Oh, are you related to the party? No, I'm not related to the party. I'm a citizen. And that's what we all need to remember, being citizens. Being citizens, being responsible citizens. Citizenship is rewarded. Citizenship is powerful. Citizenship causes things to happen. It was just last week when I welcomed and I invited new citizens uh, uh, to, uh, I, I swore we had a naturalization ceremony, and in talking to them, I told them about the power that they have. You know, they could be like uh, Barbara Jordan and and their faith in the Constitution could be whole and complete. But they could also be like Thurgood Marshall and say, well, the Constitution was infected from the outset. How dare those men decided that we the people did not include the Native Americans, didn't include the slaves that they had yet, and didn't include the women who were in the homes with them. We the people. They weren't thinking about sharing that power with someone who was not 
a property owner? We the people. It only included people who owned property. So for, for you folk who were near tenants and renters and whatever you were, we the people did not include you. So citizenship, and as I was talking to the new naturalized citizen, you know, you could be like Barbara Jordan. You could, uh, your faith in the Constitution itself could be whole, it could be complete. But you could also be like James Baldwin, uh, who talked about, because I love this country so much, I have a right. I have a right. You know, because I think he said, because I love America more than any other country in the world, and exactly for that reason, I can insist upon my right to criticize her perpetually. And because you are a citizen, you have the right, not like in some other countries, to criticize our institutions. And believe you me, sometimes our institutions need to be criticized. That's every branch. Full of compromise. We're growing up like children. We fall down, we slip up, we mess up. We have a Dred Scott decision that's by a U.S. Supreme Court. We have a Karamatsu decision that's by a U.S. Supreme Court. We get it wrong. We get it wrong. We're growing up. We're learning. So we, as citizens, have a right to do it. And I'll just uh, close on this point. And as I told the people last week at the naturalization ceremony, I found this, this, this story uh, a few years back. Again, remember who I am. Remember what time frame that I grew up in. Remember how I see folk. I had to read about John Kennedy, right? Because I was born, okay, I was born in 1964. And again, just, you know, just a casual thing, casual thing to put a pen in. You know, he did teach us some things that we just never knew about. Well, Judge Deborah Brown was born on the day that John Kennedy was assassinated. But I was reading you know, Martin Luther King, you know, he killed, you know, uh, one week before my fourth birthday. Exactly, on April 4th. My birthday is April 11th. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly one week before he's killed. But um, the night that he was, the day, the night that he was killed, the evening that he was killed, Robert F. Kennedy, you know, was running for president. And he was on his way to a campaign, came, uh, campaign stop in Indianapolis. And of course, he got word of King's death. Either way, I'm not sure, probably at the time that the plane landed, you know, we didn't, they didn't, we didn't have Snapchat and Twitter and, and all that stuff. So he got the message. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, Kennedy had been to Mississippi. He had seen Mississippi. And when he got news of the death, the crowd is there ready to welcome him. This is going to be a huge campaign ground. But he said, he stopped, he said, in this difficult day, in, in this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it is perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. That same question is appropriate in 2018. What type of nation do we want this to be? What direction should we move in? As I told, as I told the new naturalized citizens, I mean, 
Uh, I mean, because give me your tired, your poor. I mean, in, 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 in some people's imagination, that's their vision of the American. People coming over from the Atlantic, and the first thing they see is the Statue of Liberty, and they read what's on that plaque, give me your tired, your poor. And they come from a generation of people, and now they hear people talking about borders, building walls, keeping people out to a country that we welcome, we've always welcomed them in. Because the Puritans came here. Everybody else came here. I mean, some of us came here. A whole lot of different circumstances, obviously. But we welcomed them in. And so as Kennedy continued to talk that night, he said, in answering that question about what type of country do we want to move in, he said, what we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. So when people say the judge is saying, no, I'm quoting Robert Kennedy. This is what he said in 1968. A feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or they be black. And I think about that, and you know, in 2016, you have to think about it. Our America is not just white and black. So we have to say whether they're Hindu, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Native Americans, whether they're Hispanic, whether they're Asian, whether they come from the people who were carted off and put on our version of the concentration camps. Mr. Korematsu and his children. Whether they be Asian, whether they be this, whether they be that, that, whether they be gay, whether they be lesbian, whether they be whatever they be, we have to open up our arms because this is America. And in this country that we live in, that Constitution expands to encapsulate all of them and all of us. It is there for all of us because through that diversity, not only does that jury have strength, but through that diversity, America itself is much, much stronger. So I'm going to close my comments with and we'll have uh, uh, questions or, or, or discussion or whatever you want to have. I've talked much longer than I thought I would. <laughs> um, uh, what type of country do we want to see beginning 2 p.m. September 21st, 2018? What type of country do we want to leave for our children, our grandchildren? What type of country what type of Yazoo city did the people want to leave for those kids who went to Annie Ellis in 1970? One other quick story about how, our, how we can see things differently and still live with each other. I took I was appointed in 2010. I took office in 2010. And you all know how politics and everything goes. Remember, there was some, our current governor at the time, you know, they said trial balloons, floating balloons, 
sort of put that out there that I might be thinking about running. I might be. History has recorded it. Governor Haley Bible talked about those people and local people who put up the newspapers. And he was asked by whatever magazine it was that he was talking to. And the internet is a powerful thing, so you can go find it when I leave here. Say, oh, Jerry Reed was dead. No. Um, he was quoted as saying, he was talking about the White Citizens Council. And he said that those were just fine, upstanding men. And from the perspective that he grew up, they probably were. Because come to this house, ate the biscuits that somebody fixed, sat around, drank scotch, or did whatever with his parents or whatever. Went to church with them. They were good in church. They were the deacons. <laughs> come on now. Huh? I'll, come on. All of us are Baptists. Right. All of us are Baptists. Most of us are. <laughs> he, he, most of us are. Uh, he said, I'm upstanding citizens. Again, that rich diversity from which we come. Lot of Tubbs, James Wright, and those others. Some of them had to move away because their businesses were shut down. They would not see them as good people. But we need to respect the idea that people can see things differently. Now granted, I do think that the White Citizens Council is not the most precious thing that anybody ought to be a member of. <laughs> but we tolerate our differences and we draw strength from our unique differences. And we have to make sure that when we think and hear about the Constitution and those three powerful words, we the people, that we really think in our mind that we the people apply to us all. And that all of us have equal dignity, all of us have equal rights, all of us have the right, the responsibility, and the power to be good citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you.
simple concept that we need to welcome people, all people. What is it about us? I, I, I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to stay away from that subject because you said you might have to sue them. <laughs> so to the extent you might have to sue them or anybody has to sue the state of Mississippi to protect its rights and make the state of Mississippi understand that you know, this Constitution applies to me. I, I shall refrain from commenting because I might have the right, the responsibility, and the obligation to test your premise. For marriage equality, what was my deepest? You grappled with personally. Nothing. Nothing. Because. Because I do believe that the Constitution speaks for all of us. And uh, I had no problem reading the loving decision and saying that, you know, loving addressed this already. Uh, I had no reservations. I did not see harm coming to society or to anything else. And sometimes, even if there were some sort of negligible harm, it would still be the appropriate thing to do. I say negligible harm because people say that when Loving came down in 1967, that that caused others some harm. The fact that a black person can marry a white person, that might cause some negligible harm in some way, I don't know. But I didn't see that, uh, I didn't see marriage equality. I had no struggle uh, in addressing that because I thought that the Constitution allowed, permitted it. I mean, it, uh, 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 again, I, I grew up, I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I know gay people, I knew gay people, I love gay people. I mean, you know, so, so, uh, uh, no harm. So, so I had no struggle. Great. All right, maybe last question, Randy. Yeah. Hi, Judge Reed. Hi. Former Yesler. I'm former. Yeah. You never a former Yesler. You're always Yesler. So, you know, I need to leave this now. Right? And she was my eighth grade teacher. Yeah. Uh -huh. Had the most beautiful handwriting in the world. Yes, you're right. Uh, my question is, uh, and I'll say this in a little bit, uh, everyone is, well, a lot of people are up in arms about the cabinet controversy. Um, and I'm, I'm asking, not as a judge, I'm asking as Mr. Reeves right now, how do you feel about that controversy? And does Mr. Kaepernick, based on what the Constitution says, have a right to protest in the way that he did? <laughs> I'll avoid the question of whether he has a constitution right, because who knows? Some kid in high school might say that I'm Colin Ka Kaepernick and they kicked me out of school because I did it. Uh, so, so for that reason too, I'll probably not say where I stand on it, but, but we have to acknowledge that people ought to be able to speak and protest certain things in certain ways. The 1968 Olympics. Again, I wouldn't yet. I had to read about it. I was here. But I wouldn't mind. I do remember the 1972 Olympics and Munich Olympics. I do remember that. 
with the guys throwing the fist. So conscientious objections and all of that things. Of course, these football teams are owned by people and and you know there are different sort of ways in which you look at things and all that. Uh, but sometimes ath athletes could be the prime motivator, the prime sources for getting behind causes and movements and ideas and all of that. And sometimes they may be criticized on the front end. We have the classic example being Cassius Clay slash Muhammad Ali uh, and uh, uh, criticized and later almost deified. I mean, you know, when history catches up. So uh, we need to be able to tolerate each other. Tolerate our differences and our opinions, I think. And that's as one subject to what I that's how I'll answer it. All right. Great. Now let's give it up for you guys.